A few years ago, a few years ago, it was Jonathan Jones wrote in the Guardian newspaper, in Britain, abstract art is rarely the public's cup of tea. I therefore, I think, got a challenge today and I'll, I'll take up that challenge by gently introducing you to some of the concepts behind abstract art. Although um, my focus is British art, I will introduce abstract art by looking at other European countries and other artists and then return to Britain because I think it better explains the development of abstract art. I've selected, um, I had to be very selective of course with limited time and I wanted to illustrate a wide range of types of abstract art and where possible works that can be seen in London. The, um, I, I think I should start by explaining what I mean by abstract art. And I think it helps by thinking of the meaning of the word abstraction, which is the removal of extraneous parts. So if we start with the idea of art representing reality accurately, photographically, then we can abstract parts of our interpretation of reality by removing or changing parts of it. We could turn a tree trunk into a cylinder. Uh, we could turn green leaves into red diamonds, for example, that's that sort of thing, gradually abstracting the shape and the color or changing it. This work by Wyndham Lewis is um, an early example, 1913, of abstraction. Now, it might at first glance appear entirely abstract, but if you look, we can see architectural forms, uh, buildings, it looks like a modern city, although um, some people, I'm not sure I see it very clearly myself, but some people see a dancing couple with the woman on the right bending backwards. And um, they say that this thing that looks like a building down here is her skirt, and this up here is her hair. I'm not sure I see it myself or, or whether it's worth trying to see these things. Incidentally, abstract art that's entirely free of any connection with reality is known as concrete art, a term I'll be using later. Also abstraction and abstract art is associated with what's called formal analysis. At, uh, visual analysis, that is the analysis of um, a picture or an image. If it's a representational image, it can be about the subject, the symbolism, the meaning of the work, but all these are missing from abstract art. So we're left with what's called its formal properties such as color, composition, line, shape, and so on, the formal properties. And thinking about that, it raises the question of what's the difference, if any, between decorative art, so-called, and what we call fine art, we might start by thinking, well, decorative art involves repetition like, like wallpaper, but we quickly realize with other examples that this isn't true. And it becomes clear that um, the two forms of art overlap, that there isn't a great distinction between decorative art and fine art. Decorative art is a long tradition, of course, and one well-known example is Islamic art, which is um, non-figurative. And well, I should say, typically and often non-figurative. This is the great mosque at Herat in Afghanistan, which uh, although it was built in 1200, it was um, given its present appearance in the 20th century. We shall also see that many European abstract artists were trying to represent a, a higher reality and their work has a spiritual intent through its color, composition and balance. I'll give you examples of that later, but let's go back and uh, start looking at an early painting that many think um, was the beginnings of abstraction. This is Norham Castle, Sunrise, and it's a Turner, obviously. It's a late work and generally speaking, 
what we call his late work started in uh, 1835 and went on to his last exhibition in 1850 and he died the following year. The cold ghostly blue of the castle contrasts with the fireball of the glowing sun, the soft browns of the riverbank, the umber cow appears ethereal, suspended between air and water uh, until you realize that the what we're looking at is a reflection of the cow in the river. Now over the years Turner produced some 15 versions of Norham Castle and this is the last he painted and, and some see it as the greatest just to give you, why did he paint 15 views of Norham Castle? It was reported by someone traveling on a coach with him that as the coach went past Norham Castle, Turner doffed his cap at the castle. And the passenger asked why, and, he, and Turner told him he associated Norham Castle with his success as an artist. And over the years, he radically simplified the composition. Let me briefly show you the first picture he painted of Norham Castle 50 years before. He painted this when he was 22. And you can see the same um, forms in the composition, the blue of the castle, the castle is better delineated, the cows in the tweed and the fishermen. So a return to the more abstracted form. Now, in fact, this work was never seen by the public and it's possible it was never finished and he never intended it to be exhibited uh, until he'd finished it. We, we, we will never know. Um, some see it as a number, an example of um, a modernist work years ahead of its time and other people see it as simply an unfinished painting. I'll, uh, I'll leave it up to you to judge. It was in fact, it was first exhibited 50 years after his death in 1906. And um, Edward Lear, who saw it, reported that his late paintings should be seen as the wreck of a great mind, or, although Lear did add that they were the glorious setting of a glorious sun. Uh, but many don't see it that way, uh, which reminds me of a story uh, that uh, the abstract expressionist Mark Rothko, who was a great admirer of Turner, when he first saw this painting in New York in 1966, he joked, this man Turner, he learned a lot from me. With this thought in mind, we can start to see what could be elements of the natural world in Rothko's work. This is an early, uh, well, a, a, a mid-term Rothko, his early work, was a representation of landscapes, street scenes, portraits, and so on. That, that was in the 1930s. This is 1949. And it's just before um, the work that he um, donated to the Tate, which in fact he donated it to the Tate on the condition that it be exhibited in a dim room alongside or near the works of Turner. But when Tate Modern opened in 2000, the, these works of Rothko were moved to Tate Modern in the room there, which is where you've probably seen them. But I, I noticed when I went to Tate Britain on Monday this week that they've now been moved back next door to Turner's Gallery. In fact, the first room of what was Turner Gallery. Uh, so they are now alongside Turner as he um, specified when he uh, donated them to the Tate. Unfortunately, this has reduced the size of the Turner Gallery and many of my favorite works are no longer on display. Another painting that seemed to prefigure abstract painting is this work by James Abbott McNeil Whistler, Nocturne in Black and Gold. And it was this painting that gave rise to one of the central artistic controversies of the Victorian period, known as the Whistler v Ruskin trial. And the trial tells us a lot about how the Victorians regarded art 
and the nature of the changes that Whistler helped bring about. It was exhibited in the Grosvenor Gallery in 1877, which is the year the Grosvenor Gallery opened. And the works on display were reviewed by John Ruskin, the uh, most famous art critic of the Victorian period. Now Ruskin praised the work of his friend Burne Jones, but he savagely attacked Whistler. And I'll give you a brief uh, extract from what he wrote. I have seen and heard much of Cockney impudence before now, but never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. Now, because of what he wrote, Whistler sued him. Um, and at the trial, the judge had great, great trouble making out what was portrayed in this picture. And it was expected of artists at this time that they reproduce elements of reality accurately. In fact, in fact, accurate representation was one of the hallmarks of what it meant to be an artist. They were expected to be well trained and able to reproduce reality accurately, along with an imagination. Therefore, Ruskin's claim that he'd simply flung a pot of paint at the canvas was a serious criticism. It meant that he had no claim to be an artist. But Whistler asked the jury not to consider it as a traditional painting, but as what he called an artistic arrangement. Although he did insist that the painting was a representation of the firework display which was held every week at the Cremorne Gardens uh, pleasure grounds. In other words, in modern terms, Whistler was saying it was a semi-abstract painting which should be of evaluated on formal grounds in terms of its balance, color and composition. During the trial, the opposing lawyer asked if it was a picture of Cremorne Gardens and Whistler replied, if it were a view of Cremorne, it would certainly bring about nothing but disappointment on the part of the beholders. So although he did insist that it was a representation of Cremorne Gardens, he didn't want it to be seen simply as a photographic representation. He was abstracting, if you like, from the pure photographic image. Of course, it didn't help his case that at one point during the trial, the picture was uh, displayed upside down, like, like I'm showing you here. Of course, to modernize uh, this technique of holding a picture upside down, which you can do with any picture, is a very good way, uh, if you're doing visual analysis, to draw attention to its formal properties, composition, balance, color, line, shape and so on. Let's move on to, uh, well, let's jump forward 25 years to the person that um, fairly recently, I think, has been regarded as the first truly abstract artist in the modern sense, and that's Hilma Af Klint, a Swedish artist. Incidentally, the, the AF, the AF, is like a von, in Sweden, it's a reference to the fact that the family is um, ancestors of nobility, uh, although in her case, Af Klint's case, it was minor nobility. Her father was a naval officer. Um, she, like other artists I'll be talking about in a moment, Mondrian and Kandinsky, was a believer in theosophy, and I thought I would take a minute just to explain uh, what theosophy is or was, as it'll crop up a few times. In 1875, a Russian emigre in New York called Helena Blavatsky founded the Theosophical Society with a couple of other people. And it became um, very popular in America and across America and in Europe. It wasn't described as a religion, but it did claim that it would in due course replace all existing religions. 
And she claimed that during her travels uh, around the world, she had met a secret brotherhood of masters who practiced an ancient religion that was once followed by everyone across the world. And so she took elements of Buddhism, Hinduism and other religions and proposed a single divine absolute. And theosophy also believes in rebirth, reincarnation, according to the laws of karma, which is um, a form of spiritual cause and effect. You'll be the form in which you're reborn depends on um, how, how good you were in your current life. And it also was a religion, uh, not, uh, maybe a philosophy is a better name for it. It was also a philosophy that promotes or promoted universal brotherhood. So Hilmar F. Klint began producing these bright, radically abstract works in 1906, years before the other artists I'll be looking at in a moment, uh, Vasily Kandinsky, Kazimir Malevich and Pete Mondrian and others who round about 1913 would um, start to um, simplify their work, abstract their work and remove representational content. This is actually an exhibition of her work at the Guggenheim in 2018. Prior to this, and this is um, a portrait, a photograph of her. But prior to this, she painted in this sort of um, representational style, and she painted conventional landscapes and portraits like this. This is a self-portrait. She believed these images that you could see in the Guggenheim exhibition contained spiritual truths and the colors conveyed meanings. Yellow, for example, was male, blue was female, and green was the unity of the two. And she wrote notebooks, which we still have, codifying the meaning of her images. And she used single letters to refer to concepts. And she built up a sort of library of these concepts and ideas. In her will, incidentally, during her life, she rarely exhibited these large paintings. And in her will, she stipulated that they shouldn't be shown until 20 years after her death. Uh, we don't know why, but possibly she believed the public wouldn't be ready to see these abstract works for another 20 years. Uh, she died, incidentally, in 1944, so until the, the late 1960s. And um, she also specified that the work should be shown in a building that she designed specifically for the works, which was an open spiral building that she designed to house the works, much like the um, Frank Lloyd Wright building, the Guggenheim, which has got a spiral staircase going up. She, she designed a similar building um, before um, Frank Lloyd Wright even started designing the Guggenheim coincidentally. All right, let's switch back to Britain. This is David Bomberg in the hold, 1913. And he was searching at the time for a new artistic form as a, a way to express himself. He has here abstracted forms to almost a completely abstract pattern. But if we look at the study drawing that we, we have in the Tate, we can see the figures and the ladder down to the hold of the ship. Let me show you. Um, I might still need to point it out, but um, the ladder is here. This is a figure here, that's the head, that's the eye, the arm and so on. And this is the deck of the hold. So what, now you've seen that, if I go back, you can see, I'll need to switch, I think, back and forward between them. Just if you look at where the, um, the arms and the figures are, you can see in that blue in the center, the figure 
you can see the stairs as I flick backwards and forwards between them. So it's a semi-abstract work, but um, and, and also interestingly, he's retained the grid in the drawing that he used to scale up the work. A lot of artists um, drew a grid over their drawings so that they could transfer it to the canvas and scale up the work. And he's left that grid in the painted work and used it to further abstract the pattern. He was, as I said, searching for a new visual language, and I'll give you a quote. He, he wrote, the new life should find its expression in a new art, which has been stimulated by new perceptions. I want to translate the life of a great city, its motions, its machinery, into an art that shall not be photographic, but expressive. There's a lot condensed into that statement. Uh, there are elements of futurism um, in there, but also elements of um, uh, expressionism. Uh, but um, the, let, let me show you another work by um, Bomberg, produced about the same time. This is the mud bath. Bathing figures were a traditional way of depicting the nude, of course, but here Bomberg brings the subject into the modern era by basing the scene on steam baths used by the local Jewish population near Bomberg's home in East London. And he's reduced the human figure to a series of geometric shapes, a process he described, this is a quote, as searching for an intenser expression where I use naturalistic form, I have stripped it of all irrelevant matter. So he's engaged in a process of abstraction and produced these images that, that when we know what it is, we can see arms and legs, but it's um, again, a semi-abstract representation. Bomberg incidentally was born in Birmingham, the son of a Jewish Polish immigrant leather worker. And he was, apprentice to a lithographer, attended evening classes given by Walter Sickart, and um, like many artists, he attended the 1910 exhibition uh, put on by Roger Fry called Manet and the Post-Impressionists, and he managed to um, obtain a scholarship and um, a sort of grant from the Jewish community to enable him to enter the Slade, so he was one of the um, the members of the Slade at the time when it was um, training some of the, the leading 20th century British artists. The year he painted this was probably his best year as he exhibited five works, including In the Hold, the one we've just seen. And it was the year that he broke away from Wyndham Lewis's uh, Vortices group. And we've seen a work of Wyndham Lewis right at the beginning typical of the Vorticist group style, which was um, related to the Italian Futurist work. It was also the year that Bomberg held his first one man show. And outside that um, show, or, or, or this, this work was put in the window of the Chenille Gallery in Chelsea, and it literally stopped the traffic. People going past stopped in the street because they couldn't believe what they were seeing. He continued to paint in this way, but his patrons uh, didn't like this style. They wanted a more conventional style. And so he lost a lot of support with them um, because he continued to paint in what his patrons called a cubist style, a French style. And his work started to go out of favor. It was too modern for the typical British public. Let me, I'll come back to British art, but let me take an aside now to paint a bigger picture of um, abstract art and how it developed using the three artists who are conventionally regarded as creating abstract art. 
And I'll start with Pete Mondrian. All three of them developed their ideas at roughly the same time. And, and as you can see, well, I'll build up to it. But this is a work um, produced by Pete Mondrian uh, that um, called Spring Sun that he produced in 1909. And it's largely representational. I wanted to start. It's in fact um, slightly abstracted from his earlier work in the um, uh, 10 years previously, his work was much more uh, typical landscape. He wrote at this time, the emotion of beauty is always hindered by the particular appearance of an object. The object must therefore be abstracted from any figurative representation. Um, he was starting to abstract in order to invoke the feeling, the emotion of beauty, as he put it. So he was clearly searching of, for a way to remove particular appearance to arrive at the inner beauty of a scene. And I'll show you how he did that step by step, but don't misunderstand. It's not a calculated progression. He was searching every month for um, ways. Um, it was hard won. He was driven by emotion. He was incidentally a very emotional person. He, he left a very good, well-paid job. He left his fiancée when he was 39 to go and become an artist in Paris. And he was a, a great lover of jazz and an ardent dancer. So, as I said, um, hard won and driven by emotion. So the following um, year, he um, produced this Evening Red Tree. And this was the year, 1908, was the year that he joined the Dutch Theosophical Society. He became interested in theosophy, like Hilmar af Klint. It's still clearly representational, this work, but he's abstracted the colours and he's starting to switch to using primary colours. In 1911 was when he gave up his successful career and moved to Paris. He painted Grey Tree, which follows on the theme of a red tree. He's abstracted the form further, as you can see. He's removed colours at this point. They come back later. He was influenced by Cubism. But as you can see, it's not a um, typical Cubist work. He's assimilated it into his own style of representation. And then the following year, flowering apple tree. He's working with thinner paints. He's brought out the underlying structure. He's um, uh, abstracted even further, and he writes at this time that he started to combine his painting style with his ideas of theosophy and how to combine them. By 1915, this is uh, called Pier and Ocean, is a major step in his path towards abstraction, pure abstraction. Here he has eliminated diagonals and curved lines as well as colour. The only reference to nature is the horizontal lines which could allude to the horizon or the waves and the verticals which evoke the piers or pilings of the pier. In 1917, you can start to see we're almost at a what, what you might regard as a typical Mondrian, a, a later Mondrian. In 1917, composition with colours A, um, together with Theo von Duisberg, he established a group called uh, the Style, the, or the Style. Their aim was to create a new kind of art for a new and better world, as they put it. And he's seeking a balance here between the lines and blocks of colour while remaining as a, an entirely abstract work in order to invoke, he said, universal and timeless images. And then in 1920, composition with yellow, red, black, blue, and gray, um, he produced what we regard, might regard as a typical um, work of Pete Mondrian and the sort of work that he continued to paint. Mondrian thought we're all evolving. This is a theosophy belief. We're all evolving to a higher state 
and that his paintings would light a path that would help people achieve this state. Unlike um, Kazimir Malevich, who we'll see in a moment, who thought abstract art would bring about political reform, Mondrian believed it would bring about spiritual reform. And um, these abstract paintings were his mission to literally help save the world. And he firmly believed that his art, that art would replace religion and that his paintings would become beacons lighting the path to a higher state of being. So they're not, as they might appear, cold calculated paintings, but deep spiritual and emotional paintings. They are, he doesn't use a ruler, all the lines are hand painted. The thickness of the lines varies. Um, you might also regard them as cold because they, they look balanced, but if you look closely, the, the and, and other artists at the time like Duisberg pointed out to him that they weren't properly balanced and that's completely intentional. He spent a long time um, creating the feeling of not equal balance because that's static, but he aimed for a contrast uh, in order to introduce an energy or confrontation by slightly putting things in in a in a in a way that unbalances like the red on the left of this painting creates a weight on the left because it's a, a strong color. So when you look at a Mondrian, you should feel the elements aren't qu quite equally balanced, but are competing and introduce a dynamic element into the painting. And, and in fact, um, um, well, I don't want to spend too long on Mondrian, but um, independent tests carried out at university using um, non-art history students, people who didn't know Mondrian's work, when they were shown his work and a work that was very similar, but created by computer, and where his the the the, the size of the, the the rectangles was slightly altered, um, people seventy to seventy five percent of the time selected the Mondrian painting. Vasily Kandinsky, his work also started out as representational. He was also influenced by theosophy. And theosophy, uh, another part of its teaching, is that creation is a geometric progression that started with a single point and was ever expanding out from that. And Kandinsky developed these ideas in a book that uh, is called, uh, translated, Concerning the Spiritual in Art. And in, in this book, he, there are many things I could quote, but he wrote, color is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings, the artist is the hand which plays, touching one key or another to cause vibrations in the soul. And over the years, his work became more and more abstract. And within a few years, by 1915, any reference to material objects had gone. In this painting called Cossacks, um, it's not, it, it's semi-abstract because you can see on the right what appears to be buildings at the top and uh, what could be the um, bayonets of Cossacks coming over a hill. Um, but, as Kandinsky said, his aim was to produce an object-free, spiritually deep picture that suggested feelings and emotions in the same way that music did. And then just briefly, this is a, a later painting, 1913, Composition 7, and we can see how it's uh, almost completely abstracted. Kandinsky said this was the most complex piece he ever painted. Incidentally, he was born in Moscow and his father was a tea merchant. His great grandmother was a princess and he started studying law and economics and became a professor of law and didn't begin painting until he was 30, which was 1896. And then he moved to Munich where he studied art and he returned to Russia at the beginning of the First World War in 1914. And from 1918 to 1921, he was involved in the 
cultural politics of Russia, and he collaborated and was deeply involved as an administrator in art education and museum reform and painted little during that period. But his style of painting, this spiritual expressionistic view of art, this abstract view of art was rejected by um, the other administrators and artists as too individualistic and too bourgeois. So in 1921, Kandinsky left Russia, went to Germany to teach at the Bauhaus until it was closed by the Nazis in 1933 when he moved to France and he eventually became a French citizen. Kazimir Malevich is the third artist regarded as um, the one of the founders of abstract art. And Malevich, a Russian artist, was on a spiritual quest and sought to reduce art to its most basic forms so he could build a new revolutionary art. So he was a supporter of the revolution because it thought it would bring about a complete change in art. In, he, he said, only when the habit of one's consciousness to see in paintings bits of nature, Madonnas and shameless nudes has disappeared, shall we see pure painting. In other words, he entirely rejected conventional painting, which he summarized as being mere bits of nature, Madonnas, and shameless nudes, in other words, landscapes, religious paintings, and uh, typical um, paintings that were displayed in a gallery. He wanted all of that to disappear. So for it all to disappear in a revolutionary way, he had to get down, he felt to the essential, uh, well, let me give you a quote. The appearances of natural objects are in themselves meaningless. The essential thing is feeling in itself and completely independent of the context in which it has been invoked. So how did he reduce um, art to its essential nature and invoke feelings? Well, he created a style he called suprematism, which he meant the supremacy of feeling. And he started with the most basic shapes he could think of which you see here in an exhibition he held in 1915 called the 0.10, .10, in other words, the, the starting point of all future exhibitions where he starts with his basic shape. And the most basic he started with is uh, this one, black square, which you can see in the corner of the room, which was conventionally the place that in Russia, a religious icon was um, hung. Which, which was um, a controversial place to put the, the black square. He wrote in 1913, trying desperately to liberate art from the ballast of the representational world, I sought refuge in the form of the square. He said the black square is pure feeling and the white field, the void beyond feeling. It, incidentally, in this, um, uh, which, which is a reproduction of the black square as it looks now. You'll notice cracks in the image I'm showing, which is a bit, some people get a bit misled by that. There weren't cracks in the original, and I've created something closer to the original. This is what the original um, looked like. He wanted it to be pure black and pure white, as you can um, see in the corner of the room there. Another artist, and I, I just wanted to cover Pablo Picasso briefly because a number of people think of Pablo Picasso as producing um, abstract art or semi-abstract art, but in fact, he never went purely abstract and his most abstract was in 1913. Um, and he rejected concrete art, that's purely abstract art completely. And he said, there is no abstract art by which he meant that in his view, abstract art was, wasn't art. And, but I'd like to show you the journey he took towards abstraction and the point at which he stopped. 
this um, I starting when he was 11, he, he was um, child prodigy. Uh, this is study for a torso he produced when he was 11. This is science and charity, a, if you like, conventional painting that he painted when he was 15. And then I uh, won't go through the whole development. By 1913, when he was when he was 32, he entered the second phase of cubism. The first phase is called analytical cubism, and that's the type of um, cubism where the objects are broken up into fragments. But the second phase, he that's called synthetic cubism, is all about flattening the image. And in this work, bottle of uh, vieux mark glass, guitar and newspaper. Um, if you look, the, the oval edge drawn at the bottom right is the rounded edge of the table. The abstracted form of a guitar we can see, a glass you can see, a bottle of brandy where it says vieux. Um, a cut from, they, they are cut from colored paper and stuck onto the background. Viewer old, we can see, but we can't see Mark written on the bottle. We can see two pieces cut from a Figaro newspaper and um, stuck at right angles are fragments of two embroidery transfer motifs, which extend the shape to the top and the bottom. The It's a mixture of um, different views. The guitar and the table are seen from above, but the bottle and glass are shown from the side. Incidentally, the background was originally a light blue, but it's faded over time. And this is about as far as uh, Picasso took abstraction. Uh, he didn't return to representation fully, but he continued to paint in what you might call a semi-abstract form. Returning to Britain. There was, and I, and I think from now on, I think most of the, maybe with some, a few exceptions, most of the artists I'll be showing you are British artists. A very early abstract artist was Vanessa Bell, uh, sister of Virginia Woolf. And, and uh, it, it, it wasn't clear to the Tate, this is, this is in the Tate, uh, which way up to hang this painting, but the Tate analyzed the painting closely and from the direction of the brush strokes downwards and the slightly thicker paint towards the bottom of the rectangular forms, the Tate decided that this was the intended orientation. It is in fact only one of four abstract works that Bell painted around about 1914. So, so quite early, she was experimenting with abstraction and the theory of significant form and that's a, a theory that was described by her husband, Clive Bell, and her close friend, uh, Roger Fry. In fact, she had an affair with Roger Fry. And it's the idea that form of an artwork or of forms within an artwork can be expressive, even if they're largely or completely divorced from a recognizable reality, um, they can be significant, i.e. expressive, and that's what she's experimenting with here. Much later, in fact in 1980, um, in, I, I think, or towards the end of her life, her son Quentin Bell challenged her about why she gave up abstract art. He wrote, why Vanessa, I asked, did you give, up, give it up? And then he recorded that she said, Roughly speaking, her answer was because having done it, there seemed nothing else to do. And then one discovered that one was, after all, in love with nature. A bit like, I think, Picasso. And um, she, she, in other words, she didn't find it fulfilling and she experimented with it and she continued. So the following year, she painted um, in this style and continued to paint um, in a much more in a representational manner. Although some people see her experimenting with abstract art as a turning point and a much better, uh, a stronger element of proportion and spatial design informed her work from that point onwards. Another 
British abstract artist very early was uh, Jessica Dismore. She was one of only two female members of the Vorticist movement. The other was Helen Saunders. And she was an active member of the Vorticist movement. In, in fact, she was an active member of most of the avant-garde groups in London between 1912 and 1937. Uh, Vorticism, I, I haven't, I, I, I should um, say a little bit more. It flourished in London between 1912 and 1915. It was founded by Wyndham Lewis, whose work we saw right at the beginning. The name Vorticism was um, coined by Ezra Pound and the aim of the Vorticist was to relate art to modernity and industrialization. It opposed sentimentality. It extolled the virtue of the energy of the machine and um, it, it extolled, it promoted a cult of violence. Its aim, uh, because of its energy of violence, its aim was to represent the energy and vitality of the modern world. And Wyndham Lewis called it a new living abstraction. It's in some ways, and it's been described as the British form of Italian futurism, who, and futurism had similar aims. Now, Dismore came from a wealthy family, studied art at the Slade in 1902 before studying in Paris. During World War I, she worked as a nurse in France, and after the war, because of her experience in France, she suffered a mental breakdown. She was well known. Her early work was exhibited in London and Paris, and she was productive. She produced a lot of work, although sadly, a lot of her early work is now lost. Um, it was never bought by the major galleries. I think the Tate has got um, one of her works. In the 1920s, she became a member of the prestigious Seven and Five Society, and she produced representational works, including portraits. And between 1927 and 1934, she exhibited with the London Group, which included Barbara Hepworth and Ben Nicholson, of whom more in a moment. Dismore continued painting in the late 1930s, and at that period, and some people think it was partly a reaction against um, fascism, um, that in that period, her work was completely abstract in the late 1930s. Sadly, she committed suicide five days before Britain declared war on Germany in 1939, uh, partly, perhaps the forthcoming war, partly her poor uh, mental health. The fact that she I mean, you may be very familiar with her work, but um, she has to a large extent disappeared from art history. I think it's partly because she's a woman, partly because her suicide just before the start of the Second World War meant that there was no major retrospective after her death. And it, she was her work was never picked up again after the war. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of it has been lost and her radical art, and a lot of her art was radical, has been largely overlooked. So Barbara Hepworth, let me introduce a um, abstract sculpture. Her early work was, of course, highly involved with abstraction, al along with her fellow sculptor, Henry Moore. She, Hepworth, was the first to work with pierced forms in 1932. And here's an example of a pierced form, uh, which is in the Tate. And in, in 1931, she met the abstract painter Ben Nicholson and divorced her first husband, the sculptor John Skeeping, uh, later that same year, although um, they she didn't marry Nicholson immediately because Nicholson remained married and together Nicholson and Hepworth had, she had triplets by him in 1934. They were well connected. In 1933, they traveled together to France and met the leading sculptors of the day, including Constantine Bracuzzi. They also met Pablo Picasso and the same year, 
they co-founded Unit One uh, with Paul Nash with the aim of uniting surrealism with abstraction. This, uh, this is quite a small uh, work. You can see it's 21 cent uh, 61 centimeters long and 21 wide. And it draws attention to the relationship between solid material and empty space. And the suggestion is that the, um, the ball is rolling down the slope and can pass through the hole. So it, it's implied movement and a contrast of shapes, which was um, typical of the work she was producing at this period. Also, she did a lot with wood. She liked the natural warmth of the wood, which offset the, the purity and simplicity of the forms. So the two, again, were complementary, the warmth of the wood and the starkness of the forms. And this idea of complementarity, um, she also worked with at this, this time. And she liked to contrast the small with the large, round with the straight and so on. And this is a work by Ben Nicholson. He incidentally was married to a rich woman who um, subsidized him and um, played, paid for a lot of his extravagances. And so he wasn't inclined to divorce her and lose his income. But eventually they did divorce and he married um, Barbara Hepworth in 1938 which was the year before war started and in 1939 is when they just at the, when before the war started, they moved to St. Ives where they set up studio and um, Hepworth of course spent the rest of her life in St. Ives until her death because of a fire in her studio in 1975, but they divorced in 1951 and Nicholson left. Nicholson was interested in the way that paintings can represent space, which is why in 1930s he, he made these shallow reliefs that give, uh, and, and you can see from the shadows here, it actually stands out from the background. He was interested in the representation of uh, depth and defining space by actually creating a three-dimensional image. And in his, uh, some of his images he colored, but in his most radical work, he reduced the colors or removed the colors and reduced it to just white or gray to give a sense of purity. And the first, this is the first of his all white reliefs, which he, um, he made in March, 1934. And he saw them as relating to modern ideas of living modern architecture, white architecture, uh, simplified forms, natural light, formal simplicity were all major concerns of his. He did incidentally believe that abstract art should be enjoyed by the general public. It shouldn't be seen as some esoteric thing for connoisseurs. Now, Victor Passmore is um, difficult to pigeonhole. He seems straightforward, but um, was in fact very eccentric. Um, people found him difficult to understand. He was an important figure in British art, virtually unknown internationally. He started as a figurative artist. In fact, he was seen to be the most talented figurative painter of his generation. In the 1930s, he uh, experimented with abstract art, but, but dropped it. But in 1947, he pioneered abstract art in the new um, uh, British art of the 50s. And it, it, the art historian Herbert Reed has described his abstract art as the most revolutionary event in post-war British art because it was Passmore that led, led the way. He was also a teacher and taught many um, uh, famous artists. He taught at the Camberwell School of Art. He contributed to the Festival of Britain. He moved to Durham and his art teaching at Durham became the basis for higher art education across the UK. So through that, he was extremely influential. Um, incidentally, this work 
follows a naming convention he used. A lot of his works at this period were called abstract in, and then the colors are the ones that you could see. It's a bit hard to make out some of the colors that you see at the ends of these blocks, abstract in white, green, black, blue, red, gray, and pink are the colors at the ends of these blocks. I don't think it, it's a work in the Tate. It was on display at the Tate, but I think it may longer be there. It's hanging from the ceiling. The perspex sheet incidentally represents a canvas and um, he wanted to, he didn't like the idea of representational works like, like say landscapes representing uh, three dimensions art artificially through illusion. He wanted to create works that were truly three-dimensional like this work but still retained the elements of a, a canvas and the canvas has been replaced by this perspex sheet so it, it's um, it's playing with the idea of um, dimensionality two-dimensional work um, extruded into three dimensionals This um, aluminium sculpture is by the Scottish artist Eduardo Palozzi, a very influential early um, abstract artist and one of the leaders, in fact, some people say the creator of pop art in Britain. This is one of eight tower sculptures he produced. Each was cast in aluminium at a welding workshop in Ipswich, which is where he had his studio. He made the uh, cast in uh, plywood and wax, and then it, it was cast in aluminium. He had just returned from Hamburg where he was a visiting professor and taught there. And when he was there, he got his students to collect parts they found in breakers yards. And um, he and they started to assemble works from the parts they found. And when he came back to England, he started working with objects associated with industrial processes as a kind of commentary on Germany. Um, I mean, one thing he said is that they reminded him that th this work, City of the Circle and the Square, reminded him of a German town hall. And, and for him, Germany meant superb engineering, functional architecture, and a world as described by Fritz Lang in the 1929 film Metropolis, which was one of his Palozzi's favorite films. So all of that is combined. It, it may be, it reminds you of a jukebox, a computer, rows of dials in a power station. It's meant to suggest all of those sorts of things. It, it could be seen as a parody of the automated age because it's inert and functionless and has sort of um, a meaningless wheel at the bottom. So it could be seen as a, a parody. Margaret Mellis, um, perhaps less well known than Palozzi, number 35, 1983. She trained as an artist in Edinburgh and Paris. And during World War II, she joined the avant-garde community of artists in St. Ives. So she worked with or, or in the same town as Ben and knew Ben Nicholson and Barbara Hepworth. And in fact, she um, briefly lived um, with, um, with uh, Barbara Hepworth when, they first, when she first went with her husband, Adrian Stokes in 1939. This work um, consists of, or is constructed from driftwood. You can see pieces of mahogany, pine and plywood, which she collected at the beach when she was in Southwold, uh, which she moved to in 1976. Southwold, incidentally, is next to Walberswick, which is um, where there was an artistic community which developed initially with artists um, going much further back, like uh, Philip Wilson Steer and Charles Rennie Mackintosh. Now, some of the pieces that she found on the beach were already painted and others she found painted but didn't like the colour so overpainted and some she painted herself and she regarded her her walk down the beach she called it uh, like a hunt and when she found a piece of driftwood she liked she called it her trophy and brought it back to her studio where she collected piles of these things and then later she would assemble them 
um, gradually over a number of months, and she made some 35 uh, works of, uh, made out of this driftwood. And this work, <clears throat> she thinks there were about 35, but this work, number 35, she thought was um, her last and her best work, and it's in the Tate. In fact, I'm not sure it's on display at the moment. Incidentally, she numbered them uh, simply because at the time she couldn't think of titles, uh, but later <laughs> she couldn't remember the numbers and started to get confused between them and started to find it easy uh, to give them titles. So um, her later, uh, some, some of the works and later works have titles. And in case you're wondering, she told the Tate, she stated the Tate, the number 35 should not have a hyphen in it. Frank Bowling spread out Ron Kitte. Frank Bowling was born in Guyana in the West Indies, but he moved to London when he was 19 in the 1950s. And after completing his national service, he was in the Royal Air Force. He studied at the Chelsea School of Art and won a scholarship to the Royal College of Art, where he studied at the um, same time as R.B. Kitte, David Hockney, Alan Jones, and so on. Now, <laughs> when he was there at the Royal College of Art with David Hockney in 1962 was the final year, and he, Bowling, was expected to win the gold medal. But in 1962, years previously, he'd married the registrar of the college at a time when relationships between staff and students were banned because they thought they might, one might influence. Um, so he was relegated to silver medal and David Hockney was awarded the gold medal that year. If it hadn't been for the marriage, it was most likely have been the other way around. Well, after that, um, he moved to America like uh, David Hockney, but um, Frank Bolin moved to New York in the mid sixties and found a freedom in abstract art, working alongside artists like Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock and Barnett Newman. And he spoke about his move towards abstract art as a process of unlearning because his early work was figurative but by the mid 1970s, this is 84 to six, by the mid 70s, it had become almost entirely abstract. Incidentally, he now, he's still alive and he travels between London and New York. He was the first black artist to be elected a Royal Academician. And in 2020, he was knighted for services to art. On this work, he spread out Ron Kitte, he, he, some critics see it as um, a reference to the tropical landscapes of Guyana uh, or, or his experiences of nature in general. And the, the surface, it's a bit difficult to see in the reproduction, but the surface sheen and detail suggest organic matter in a state of decay. But Bowling himself has always avoided discussing any personal meaning in his work, although in a letter, to the Tate in 1986, he said the title was inspired by an encouraging letter he'd received um, from Kite the same day um, that he was inspired by a West Indian, a reggae song he heard on the car radio. And because of the encouraging letter from Kite, which inspired him and the song he was going to call it, homage to RBK, but the word spread out was what he shouted to his team when he played football to encourage them. And he thought it more, impro impo uh, more appropriate because Kite had encouraged him with the letter. I, I know it's, it's slightly complicated um, set of things, uh, but that was explained in a letter to the Tate explaining the title of the work but he doesn't say a lot more. I mean, we could tell you a lot more about how he constructed the work, but um, uh, well, well, let me just say um, one uh, thing that um, 
because it's not clear from here. Well, first of all, you can see that it's quite a large work, nearly three meters wide, and it was made from a variety of materials and it's included on the surface is costume jewelry, Christmas glitter, plastic shell, sorry, plastic toys and oyster shells. But it's not a collage exactly because they're all hidden under the acrylic paint. He started with um, a canvas and he glued, can you see that sort of raised shape? Well, it is actually raised. It's acrylic foam that he glued to the canvas before he began. And after preparing the canvas with, with a sort of um, a coating, uh, an undercoat, he would hang it on the wall. Um, uh, and sorry, he would prepare it on the wall and undercoat it, which would stick the foam to the canvas. Although you can see in places the foam has sort of moved downwards. He would then put it on the floor, add these glitter and jewelry and toys, and then cover them with thick layers of paint that were poured onto the canvas in the same manner that Jackson Pollock did, but in a very, uh, with a very different effect. Uh, he, but he did use controlled accidents and unexpected effects like Pollock, but a very, uh, Pollock's much more controlled in the way he does it. Bridget Riley. The, in this work, and um, her early work is sort of op art and controlled illusions, and there's, there's some element of that in this, but the shapes evoke the outlines of leaves, perhaps, or petals, and the sense of movement. There's a sort of a movement flow, a flow through it suggests maybe waves on a river or on the ocean. And she, Riley, has spoken about her great love of nature. And um, although the forms in this painting, which is called Evo 3, are not directly representational, as I said, they do suggest the shapes and rhythms of the natural world. She has said, and I think this is an interesting quote, the only way anyone can enter my painting is by looking. There's no theory in them. The very habit ridden public, and I'm not blaming them, wants something that looks like a painting. End quote. Now, as a student, she was such a good figure painter that she won a place at Goldsmiths, but later, she rejected the direct depiction of people, which she said she loved and enjoyed, but she wanted to find out about this new world. And in fact, she spent, it, she never stopped <laughs> finding out about this new world. So she continued in this abstract style from then onwards. Her studio is still um, on the upper floors of a West London terraced house where she lives and works. She gets out of bed, goes straight to the studio every day. Uh, she now has to employ assistance because of the, the manual labor um, and involved in the work. And she's never married, she has no children, she's lived alone for decades. And her students uh, prepare the work under her, um, according to her notes and under her direction. This particular work, um, she's always thought of this as associated with revelry because um, Evo, Evo is a Bacchanalian cry, uh, the shout of joy at the festivals of Bacchus. And, and she's actually written that when she'd finished Evo, Evo and was thinking about its title, she toyed with the idea of calling it Bacchanal without nymphs. But she suddenly remembered, she said, just in time, that after all, I'm supposed to be an abstract artist. This is my final work, and it's by Rachel Whiteread. And this is an interesting work. I'll explain why it's called Unti Untitled Floor. It's in the Tate. 
It looks completely abstract, but in some ways it's purely representational because it's a cast of an area underneath the floorboards of a house. It's 14 rectangular blocks made from polyester resin arranged flat on the floor and in two even columns of seven. The work was made by taking a cast of a wooden floor so that each slab you can see the floorboards and the wood grain and the sections are installed to loosely replicate the layout of the cast floor. In fact, I had to look this up because I couldn't understand how she took a cast of the underneath of a floor, but in fact, she had to cheat. So in order to make the cast, what she did is she created a fictional floor in her studio. I don't know whether she used real floorboards. So the floor was upside down. In other words, the floorboards were touching the floor underneath. So this is the underneath of the floor with the joists joining them together. She made a plaster cast of the interior between the joists, took out the plaster and then made molds from the casts, took out the plaster, kept left with the mold, and then she slowly filled the mold with resin. And in fact, it was very slowly because she found she couldn't add more than one millimeter per day of the resin without losing the, tran the translucency of the resin. This is the first work that Rachel Wright Reed used resin on. And so it, it involved a lot of um, uh, experimentation and uh, discovery and it opens up the interior space of her sculpture and enables it to interact with light uh, but you're thinking that this is just a, a dark brooding secretive work but um, I can tell you that it's transformed and and it was um, in the Tate it was near a window by the sun the, the blocks are actually translucent and emerald green when the sun shines on them with flashes of gold. It looks completely different in the sun. So this hard, unforgiving look turns into the illusion of water and movement when lit by the sun. Why did she produce it? Well, for many, as we've seen, for many abstract artists, the artwork is purely abstract concrete art and purely aesthetic to be judged on formal grounds. It has no meaning. But for White Reed, it's a bit different. I've already said that in some ways you could see this as purely representational and it's to do, she has said, with transforming people's emotional and social investment in their houses and furniture into sculptural forms. Now, rather than um, taking a cast or representing their houses and furniture, uh, although she did do that with her work House. She shows that the places where people are absent, the structures that embed the repeated actions of people, the spaces that people left, the marks left by people, the spaces that were used by people. So she makes the absent present Now, that comes to the end of my talk. I hope I haven't, and I probably have, missed out your favourite abstract artist. Incidentally, one artist I wished I had time to include was Peter Lanyon, um, but I said there are many others. Um, still, I hope you enjoyed the tour through abstract art and that your enjoyment will be increased the next time you visit the gallery. Thank you.